hi guys so this is going up to the students in law 1204 and I'm just um, excited to be able to connect with you this way and grateful that we still have this opportunity to connect with one another and continue the learning uh, experience this semester even though it's a bit different than what we're used to so this is the first of the video lectures that you'll get this um, these next few weeks and this content is um, specific to what we would be discussing in on March 27th so that's um, for what the class discussion would be that week. So there's a few topics we're covering on March 27th, but uh, the first one is defenses to negligence. Now a few weeks ago, when we were still in class together, we were able to discuss the different um, concepts about negligence and uh, the duty of care and the standard of care and all of that that was required to make a negligence action. So today we're looking at um, what could limit the defendant's liability. So once a plaintiff has been able to um, prove um, all of those elements of the tort of negligence, then the burden shifts to the defendant to be able to, at some point, raise a defense and in some way limit their liability, either entirely or partially. So some of these defenses are whole defenses. A whole defense means it limits the liability on the defendant entirely. So there's no um, discussion by the court about the defendant is 60% liable and so is going to pay a certain amount of what the entire uh, liability amount would be. An entire or a whole defense completely blankets the defendant from any payout or liability for damages, okay? A partial defense is different from that then in that it means that it can partially cover the defendant from liability. So in the reference I gave for what would not be a whole defense, um, in the same way, a defendant could be found to be 20% liable or 80% liable or 50% liable. So whatever the total amount of damages the court has identified as being linked to this negligent act, if the defendant is only 80% liable, they would only need to pay 80% of what that entire amount was. So that's a partial defense, not in a whole or not an entire defense. So some of the defenses that we're talking about are whole and some are partial. And I will point those out to you as we go along. So once the plaintiff proves all of the necessary elements of the tort of negligence, then it is up to the defendant to raise a defense, right? That is going to limit or either cancel, cancel out entirely their liability. So what are those defenses that are recognized? There's five that we're going to talk about. Uh, limitation period is one, and that's a pretty easy one. Uh, voluntary assumption of risk is the second. Illegality is the third. Contributory negligence is the fourth. And then where there are joint tort feasors, that's the fifth, okay? So we're going to start off here with the uh, limitation periods defense. And essentially this operates as a whole defense. So what this means is if the limitation period has expired, it is an entire defense for that defendant. They are not going to be found liable for any acts that might otherwise have been seen or found to be negligent the defendant would have to show the expiration of that limitation period. Okay, so the limitation period has passed. This means that the court actually never gets to the stage of looking at the case and considering the case on its merits. When we use that terminology, the case on its merits, it means the court actually listening to the stories of both sides. So listening to the plaintiff's claim and their witnesses, expert witnesses, reading through their pleadings, the ability to listen to the examination of witnesses and cross-examination, and the same for the defendants to call um, witnesses and to basically plead their defense. If the defendant pleads the limitation period has passed, this is done very early on in the proceedings, and so the court never listens to the case on its merits to determine if in fact there was negligence or not. So once the limitation period has passed, um, a plaintiff's claim cannot proceed. The exception to this is uh, the discoverability principle or rule. So if the plaintiff claims in response to a limitation defense, if the plaintiff claims the discoverability rule, that essentially means that they were not known, uh, sorry, the injury that they sustained as a result of some negligent act was not known to them on the original date that it um, occurred. So it was known to them at some point later. It could have been five years later. It could have been 10 years later. And whatever time they became known, um, the injury became known to them. At that point, the limitation period starts to run, okay? So if the defendant claims, sorry, the limitation period has passed, it's been three years, it's been four years since the date of the injury, the plaintiff can claim um, in response to that, hold on a second though, I didn't know I suffered an injury four years ago, and it just became known to me that I have. 
And so then that would therefore, um, I guess, disprove or cross out the limitation period defense and allow the plaintiff to pursue their claim. All of that would happen in the really early stages of so preliminary, ma preliminary matters that would go before the court. <clears throat> so the limitation period defense is actually raised by the Limitations Act in Ontario. Um, the basic limitation period is set out in the Limitations Act at Section 4, and that specifically states that um, a proceeding shall not be commenced in respect of a claim after the second anniversary of the day on which the claim was discovered. Okay, so that's the two-year period right there. And then the discoverability rule or the discoverability principle flows just after that in the legislation at Section 5. There was a case, um, an older one, not as old as some of the ones we've discussed in this class, but a 1992 decision from the Supreme Court of Canada. And this talked about the discoverability rule in the area of child sexual assault. The Supreme Court ruled that in cases of childhood sexual assault, the limitation period should not begin to run until the plaintiff was aware of the harm that they had suffered. So that comes from the MK versus MH case in 1992. That case is listed on the slides for you, so you could look into that further if you were curious. At the bottom of those slide, uh, that slide is, um, um, I guess, a bracketed, um, what's the word, a name, and it says from LEAF, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund. So I just wanted to be clear to you what that is. You might have heard of LEAF. You may not have. You might have heard of the term intervener. You may not have. Although I believe that we have discussed intervener earlier on in the semester. So the intervener um, has to apply to the court in any case, if they are not the um, plaintiff or the defendant, to have a say in the proceedings. Essentially, they want to have their voice heard. Why would they be granted intervener status? Typically, if they have an interest in the outcome of the case. And most oftentimes, you see uh, public interest bodies intervening to try to have a say in the matter. So LEAF, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, is a common intervener that you will see arise in cases that have gone up to the Supreme Court of Canada, where they want to have a public interest say for matters that might impact women and children. Okay, so um, LEAF is identified there on the slide as being an intervener in this case. So then moving on then to the second uh, defense I wanted to discuss with you was voluntary assumption of risk. Essentially, there's the Latin term for it there, and the quote is below the Latin term that says, no harm is done to someone who is really willing. So in other words, if you enter into an activity where you know there is risk and you've assumed that risk, you can't later claim harm that's resulted from that, from that act, whatever it might have been that you entered into. So this occurs where the plaintiff has accepted both the physical risk and the legal risk. So the physical risk being um, knowing that it could suffer some harm to their physical person, to their body, the legal risk no, being uh, knowing that they're entering into a relationship where they've waived their legal rights to sue later on. And so typically, voluntary assumption of risk are clauses that a plaintiff has to sign, or at this point, they're not a plaintiff, they're the person who's just entering into that action prior to um, engaging in some kind of activity. So we've talked a little bit about this before in their area of consent. It sounds a little bit like consent, um, but if an individual is entering into some kind of uh, medical office, maybe chiropractic care, and signing a waiver that they're not going to sue if something goes wrong, or if you choose to go skydiving, um, you know there's some risk involved with that, you're not going to go sue if something goes wrong. This is the concept of voluntary assumption of risk and accepting both the physical and legal risk that might stem from that activity. Okay. <clears throat> to be successful in raising the voluntary assumption of risk defense, the defendant has to prove that there was either an express or an implied agreement. We've talked about those distinctions between express and implied before, and express being very clearly written or stated, either verbally or in writing. Um, implied being um, not specifically stated in words, but assumed by the individual individual's actions, right? So if the... Um, defendant in the action and said, sure, you can come on this plane and you can skydive out of this plane, but there are some risks, uh, blah, 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 A, B, C, D, those are the risks. Do you agree to do this? And the plaintiff walks forward into the plane. That would be an implied agreement, okay? So the defendant would have to prove that there was an express or an implied agreement between the parties where the plaintiff had consented to accept the physical damage that might arise out of a negligence from the defendant. 
Okay? And then also the plaintiff agreed to abandon their right to sue. So there was a case, another one, of course. It's called Miller versus Decker, and it comes um, from a 1957 decision. The case that's um, identified on the slides for you is the one that comes out of the Dominion Law Reports. That was the publisher for this case. So essentially in this case, um, these two guys decided to go, quote, beering. That's what the judge called it after um, a fun night out. After they decided to drink in the car, they were going to go to a dance. So they drank for some time. Um, they got in the car to drive to the dance. An accident occurred on the way. Um, and the plaintiff then sued the defendant, who were friends prior to this, Miller and Decker, for the injuries that he sustained. And in this case comes the concept of voluntary, voluntary assumption of risk. A quote from the case directly says, The plaintiff could not recover. The circumstances were such as to lead necessarily to the inference that he had impliedly and with full knowledge of the nature and extent of the risk resulting from the Jay's driving agreed to assume that risk. So he chose to enter into that, that category of fun for that night, right? He knew that they were going to be drinking and he still chose to go, get in the car with his friend who was rather intoxicated at the time. Therefore, he couldn't... Um, sue his friend and his friend would not be found liable for damages that resulted out of his own voluntary assumption of risk. I'm going to pause this video there and we're going to come back for part two to discuss some more defenses shortly. Thanks.